In American history, one legendary event stands out as a quintessential symbol of the Wild West, the gunfight at the O.K. Corral. This historic shootout, etched forever in the minds of people, epitomizes the bravery, lawlessness, and intrigue that define the American Old West. In this video, we dive into the heart of this iconic confrontation, exploring its origins, the characters involved, and the lasting legacy it left behind. Step back in time and witness the drama as it unfolds in this captivating tale of the West's most famous and fateful gunfight. Remember to hit the like button because it helps us a lot. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell to not miss the upcoming interesting videos. The gunfight at the OK Corral was one of the most famous shootouts in the American West. A 30-second gunfight between lawmen led by Virgil Earp and members of the Clanton Gang, who are better known as the Cowboys, occurred around 3 p.m. Wednesday, October 26, 1881 in Tombstone, Arizona Territory, United States. Tombstone, located in the Arizona Territory, about 30 miles from the Mexican border, was founded in March 1879 after silver was discovered in the area. Like many of the mining boomtowns that dot the American border, Tombstone has experienced rapid development. Originally settled by only 100 individuals, Within two years, by the end of 1881, the population had skyrocketed to about 7,000. It turned into the largest boomtown in the American Southwest, attracting people from a variety of backgrounds, including Chinese, Mexicans, women, and children. However, the town's burgeoning prosperity also attracted horse rustlers and bandits from the surrounding countryside, resulting in frequent shootings. Livestock theft and cross-border alcohol smuggling were rampant in the 1880s. The Mexican government levied heavy export taxes on these items, and smugglers made a large profit by stealing them in Mexico and selling them in Tombstone. On December 1, 1879, three notable figures, James, Virgil, and Wyatt Earp, arrived at Tombstone. When the town consists of tents for lodging, a number of taverns and other buildings, and prospering mining sites. Virgil had been hired as Deputy U.S. Marshal for Eastern Pima County, with his office in Tombstone, just days before his arrival. In June 1881, he was also appointed Marshal of the town of Tombstone. Although unpopular with the townspeople, the Earp brothers tended to protect the interests of the town's business owners and residents. However, a fascinating incident occurred when Wyatt intervened to rescue outlaw Curly Bill Brocious from execution after he accidentally killed Tombstone Sheriff Fred White. Meanwhile, Cochise County Sheriff Johnny Behan was generally sympathetic to the interests of the rural ranchers and members of the Cowboys, of which Brocious was also included. In the summer of July 1880, Captain Joseph H. Hurst, commander of Company A, of the U.S. 12th Infantry Division and stationed at Fort Bennett, asked U.S. Deputy Marshal Virgil Earp to help him track down the cowboys who had stolen six U.S. Army mules from Camp Rucker. Virgil Earp, along with Wyatt and Morgan Earp, and Wells Fargo agent Marshal Williams, formed a team to track down the culprit. The posse found the stolen mules on McLaurie's ranch on Baba Kamari Creek, located northwest of Tombstone, as well as the branding iron used to change the U.S. brand to D-8. To avoid violence, one of the cowboys named Frank Patterson promised to return the mules, and the team agreed to wait. However, two days later, the cowboys returned without a mule, mocking Hearst and the Earps. In response, Hearst had printed and distributed a handbill in which he named Frank McLaurie as specifically assisting with hiding the mules. He reprinted this in the Tombstone Epitaph on July 30, 1880. Virgil later said that McLaurie had asked him if he had posted the handbills. When Virgil said he had not, McLaurie said if Virgil printed the handbills, it was Frank's intention to kill Virgil. He warned Virgil, if you ever again follow us as close as you did, then you will have to fight anyway. This incident marked the initial clash between the Cowboys and the Earp brothers, setting the stage for future conflicts. Tensions between the Earps and the McLaurys further increased, 
when another passenger stage on the Sandy Bob line in the Tombstone area, bound for Bisbee, was held up on September 8, 1881. The masked bandits robbed all of the passengers of their valuables since the stage was not carrying a strong box. During the robbery, the driver heard one of the robbers describe the money as sugar, a phrase known to be used by Frank Stillwell. Stillwell had, until the prior month, been a deputy for Sheriff Behan, but had been fired for accounting irregularities. At the scene, Wyatt discovered an unusual boot print left by someone wearing a custom-repaired boot heel. The Herbs checked a shoe repair shop in Bisbee known to provide widened boot heels and were able to link the boot print to Stillwell. Upon arrival at Bisbee, Frank Stillwell, along with his partner Pete Spence, were immediately arrested by Deputy U.S. Marshal Virgil Earp for holding goods. Both Stillwell and Spence are known to be associates of Ike Clanton and the McLaurys, raising suspicions before the law. During the preliminary hearing, Stillwell and Spence attempted to provide an alibi supported by several witnesses. Judge Spicer dropped the charge because there was not enough evidence. Their freedom was short-lived, however, as Virgil Earp arrested them on October 13th, this time accusing them of robbing Bisbee and obstructing a mail carrier. Notably, the newspapers reported that they'd been arrested for another stage robbery that occurred on October 8th near Contention City. Ike and the other cowboys believe the new arrest is further evidence that Earps is persecuting the cowboys illegally. When Virgil and Wyatt Earp arrived in Tucson for a federal hearing on the charges against Stillwell and Spence, Frank McLaurie confronted Morgan Earp. McLaurie has issued a warning to Morgan. He will kill the Earps if they try to capture Spence and Stillwell again. The Tombstone Epitaph reported that since the arrest of Spence and Stillwell, veiled threats are being made that the friends of the accused will get the Earps. On October 25, 1881, while Clanton was at Tombstone, drunk and very noisy, Holiday accused him of lying about the robbery of Benson's carriage. They got into a heated argument. Virgil Earp intervened and threatened to arrest both Holiday and Clanton if they didn't stop arguing. After Holiday's confrontation with Ike Clanton, Wyatt Earp took Holiday back to his room at Camilla Sidney Buck Fly's lodging house. Meanwhile, Virgil Earp played a poker game with Ike Clanton, Tom McLaurie, Cochise County Sheriff Johnny Behan, and an unnamed fifth man in the back room of the Occidental Saloon until morning. At around dawn on October 26, the card game ended and Behan and Virgil Earp went home to bed. Clanton later testified that he observed Virgil putting the pistol in his pants as the match ended. Unable to rent a room, McLaurie and Clanton had nowhere to go. Shortly after 8 a.m., bar worker Boyle spoke to Ike Clanton in front of the telegraph office. Clanton had been drinking all night and Boyle encouraged him to get some sleep but Ike insisted he wouldn't go to bed. Boyle later testified that he noticed Ike was armed. By noon that day, Ike was still drinking and expressed his intention to find Holiday or Earp. Around 1 p.m., Clanton faced an unexpected encounter when Virgil and Morgan Earp ambushed him on 4th Street. Virgil pistol-whipped him from behind, disarming him. Earps brought Ike before Justice of the Peace A.O. Wallace for violating the ordinance. Wyatt waited with Clanton while Virgil searched for Justice Wallace so that the trial could be held. While Wyatt waited for Virgil to return with Justice Wallace, witnesses overheard Wyatt tell Clanton, You cattle-thieving son of a bitch, and you know that I know you are a cattle-thieving son of a bitch. You've threatened my life enough, and you've got to fight. Ike Clanton was heard to reply, Fight is my racket, and all I want is four feet of ground. After the incident, Ike reported in his testimony that Wyatt Earp directed curses at him. Additionally, Ike vehemently denied making any threats against the Earp brothers. As a result of the trial, Judge Wallace fined Ike $25 or $760 in 2022 dollars. Ike then paid the fine, and Virgil told Ike he could retrieve his confiscated rifle and revolver at the Grand Hotel, a popular gathering spot for the Cowboys during their time in town. 
Outside the courthouse, as Tombstone Deputy Marshal, Wyatt Earp is bumping into Tom McLaurie, a 28-year-old newcomer to the town. By city ordinance, Tom is required to deposit his pistol when entering the city. When Wyatt asked, are you healed or not, McLaurie said he was unarmed. Wyatt testified that he clearly observed a revolver located on Tom's right hip. As an unpaid deputy marshal for Virgil, Wyatt habitually carried a pistol in his waistband or in a coat pocket lined with leather to make drawing it easier. Witnesses later recounted that Wyatt quickly pulled his revolver from his coat pocket and, without hesitation, whipped Tom McLaurie with it twice, leaving him lying on his stomach and bleeding out on the street. At about 1.30 p.m., Ike's 19-year-old brother Billy Clanton and Tom's brother Frank McLaurie arrived in town. Alerted by their neighbor Ed Frank of the trouble caused by Ike the night before, they rode into town to aid their brothers. The moment they arrived, Billy and Frank learned of their brother's recent confrontation with the Herbs, which became the main topic of discussion in town. Enraged, Frank announced his intention not to drink, and without delay, both brothers left the saloon to find Tom. According to city regulations, both Frank and Billy should have surrendered their weapons at the Grand Hotel. Instead, they remained fully armed. Wyatt said that he saw Billy Clanton and Frank McLaurie in... Bangling Burger's gun and hardware store on 4th Street, filling their gun belts with cartridges. Ike testified afterward that Tom was not there and that he had tried to buy a new revolver, but the owner saw Ike's bandaged head and refused to sell him one. Ike apparently had not heard Virgil tell him that his confiscated weapons were at the Grand Hotel around the corner from Spangenberger's shop. When Virgil Earp learned that Wyatt was talking to the cowboys at Spangenberg's gun shop, he went there himself. Virgil went around the corner on Allen Street to the Wells Fargo office, where he picked up a 10-gauge or 12-gauge short double-barreled shotgun. It was an unusually cold and windy day in Tombstone, and Virgil was wearing a long overcoat. To avoid alarming Tombstone's public, Virgil hid the shotgun under his overcoat and when he returned to Hafford's saloon. From Spangenberg's, the cowboys moved to the O.K. Corral, where witnesses overheard them threatening to kill the herbs. For unknown reasons, the cowboys then walked out the back of the O.K. Corral and then west, stopping in a narrow, empty lot next to C.S. Fly's boarding house. Cochise County Sheriff Johnny Behan tried to convince Frank McLaurie to give up his weapon, but Frank insisted that he would only give up his gun after Virgil Earp and his brothers were disarmed for the first time. As usual, Earps carried revolvers in their coat pockets or in their belts. Wyatt Earp was carrying an American 44 caliber Smith & Wesson 1869 revolver. Holiday carried a nickel-plated pistol in a holster, but the gun was concealed in his long coat. Earps and Holiday head west, down south of Fremont Street, through the back entrance of the O.K. Corral. Virgil later testified that Behan had told him, for God's sake, don't go down there or they'll murder you. One witness, washerman Peter H. Falehi, later testified that Virgil Earp told Behan, those men have made their threats and I will not arrest them, but I will kill them on sight. Wyatt testified that he saw Frank McLaurie, Tom McLaurie, and Billy Clanton standing in a row against the east side of the building on the opposite side of the vacant space west of Fly's photograph gallery. Ike Clanton and Billy Claiborne and a man I don't know were standing in the vacant space about halfway between the photograph gallery and the next building west. Wyatt Earp drew a sketch in 1924 and another with John Flood on September 15, 1926, that depicted Billy Clanton in the middle of the lot, close to the Harworth house. Tom and Frank McLaurie stood deeper in the lot. Frank was in the center between the two buildings, holding the reins of his horse. Tom was closer to C.S. Fly's boarding house. According to Wyatt's sketches, Morgan was on the right of the lawmen, close to the Harwood house, opposite Billy Clanton, near the Harwood house and close to Fremont Street. Virgil was deeper in the lot, opposite Frank and Ike Clanton. Wyatt was to Virgil's left, opposite Tom. Doc Holliday hung back a step or two on Fremont Street. 
Neither of Wyatt's sketches included Ike Clanton or Billy Claiborne, who ran from the fight. When Virgil saw the Cowboys, he testified, he immediately commanded the Cowboys to throw up your hands, I want your guns. Wyatt said Virgil told the Cowboys, throw up your hands, I have come to disarm you. Virgil and Wyatt both testified that they saw Frank McLaurie and Billy Clanton draw and cock their single-action six-shot revolvers. Virgil shouted, Hold! I don't mean that! Jeff Morey, who served as a historical consultant on the movie Tombstone, compared eyewitness testimony and came to the conclusion that Earps described the situation correctly. Wyatt testified, Billy Clanton leveled his pistol at me, but I did not aim at him. I knew that Frank McLaurie had the reputation of being a good shot and a dangerous man, and I aimed at Frank McLaurie. He said he shot Frank McLaurie after both he and Billy Clanton went for their revolvers. The first two shots were fired at Billy Clanton and myself, he shooting at me and I shooting at Frank McLaurie. Maury agreed that Billy Clanton and Wyatt Earp fired first. Clanton missed, but Earp shot Frank McLaurie in the stomach. After fatally shooting Tom, Holiday tossed aside the empty shotgun, pulled out his nickel-plated revolver, and continued shooting at Frank McLaurie and Billy Clanton. However, when the gunfight broke out, Clanton ran up and grabbed Wyatt, saying he was unarmed and didn't want to fight. To this outcry, Wyatt said he responded, Go to fighting or get away. Clanton ran through the front door of Fly's Inn and escaped unharmed. Like Ike, Billy Claiborne is unarmed. He and cowboy Wes Fuller, who was in the back of the lot, also fled the fight as soon as the shooting began. According to the Tombstone Epitaph, Wyatt Earp got up and fired repeatedly but failed to hit. Morgan Earp fired almost immediately as Billy Clanton drew his gun right-handed. Morgan's shot hit Billy in the right wrist, disabling his hand. Forced to shift a revolver to his left hand, Clanton continued shooting until he emptied the gun. Virgil and Wyatt were now firing. Morgan Earp tripped and fell over a newly buried water line and fired from the ground. Wyatt shot Frank McLaurie in the abdomen, and Frank took his horse by its reins and struggled across Fremont Street. Frank and Holiday exchanged shots as Frank moved across Fremont Street, and Frank hit Holiday in his pistol pocket, grazing him. Holiday followed him, exclaiming, That son of a bitch has shot me and I'm going to kill him. Morgan Earp picked himself up and also fired at Frank. Frank fell to the sidewalk on the east side of Fremont Street. Both Morgan and Holiday seemed to think they fired the shot that killed Frank, but since neither testified at the hearing, this information is only from witnesses. A passerby testified, He stopped to help Frank and saw Frank try to speak, but he died on the spot before he could move. Despite his injuries, Billy Clanton continued to open fire. Billy shot Morgan Earp in the back. Billy shot Virgil Earp in the calf. Billy Clanton was then shot in the wrist, chest, stomach, and fell near his original location in the corner of the Harwood House in the lot between the house and Fly's lodging house. Moments later, Tom McLaurie was carried from the corner of Fremont Street, where he died speechless. Passersby carried Billy Clanton to the Hardwood House. Billy was in great pain and asked for a doctor and some morphine. He told people nearby, They've murdered me. I've been murdered. Chase the crowd away and from the door and give me air. Billy gasped, and another heard him say, Go away and let me die. Then he passed away. The 30-second gunfight left Billy Clanton, Frank McLaurie, and Tom McLaurie dead. Virgil Earp and Morgan are injured. Sheriff John Behan arrested Virgil, Wyatt, and Morgan Earp, as well as Doc Holliday for the murders of Billy Clanton and Tom and Frank McLaurie. However, Judge Wells Spicer, who was involved with Earps, decided that the defendants were justified for their actions. The town is divided, with many supporting the Clantons and others supporting the Earps. The funeral that followed was the largest in Tombstone's history, with more than 300 people following the hearse and 2,000 watching from the city's sidewalks. Three cowboys are buried at Boot Hill Cemetery. Over the next few months, while Earps struggled for control of Tombstone, Virgil Earp was wounded by an assassination attempt, and Morgan Earp was killed while he was playing billiards on March 18, 1882. Witnesses assert that Frank Stilwell was seen running from the crime scene, and three days later, Stilwell was found dead. A Mexican also involved in the case was found murdered in a log camp. 
it is believed that Wyatt Earp was responsible for killing both men. Please like and share if you find the video content interesting and useful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment below so as not to miss the upcoming interesting videos. Thanks for watching.